Here at Glastonbury. Been, you know, an amazing thing to be able to do that. Really, the last year, I mean, up until August, I was just pretty much on the road. My name is Sandy. I'm a singer-songwriter. I started off songwriting when I was 12 years old. I made my first EP when I was 14. I joined my first professional band when I was 14. I basically did nothing except for that. I went to performing arts school when I was 17. And since that age, I have only ever had a career in music. To be honest, the one thing that makes a good song is honesty real heartache, real um, anger, real whatever the feeling may be. It's those moments that you find yourself inspired to write something. And that is what makes a great song. I was born in a town called Banff, which is in the northeast of Scotland. I realized I could sing when I was about three years old. And my dad, my dad has a great voice. My dad is also called Sandy. But I always used to listen to my dad sing and my auntie taught me how to play piano. And so my whole life, like when I was growing up, there was all these people who were musical and influenced me. So I was in that environment all the time. So I would always sing. And so that there's so many members of my family that are musically inclined um, and very creative. I always had an ability to make stuff up. So when I was 12, I started writing songs and it was about things that were in my life, emotions and things I was struggling with, like puberty and, and all sorts of things. And also my, my parents had split up and I had all these emotions and there was some turmoil and things. So I wrote it all down and I, I wrote these four songs and they became the, the first EP that I ever made. And I, and I went and recorded it and I did my first video interview when I was like 13 or something. Everything from when I was a little girl was geared towards singing and songwriting and being a musician. First thing I learned to play was piano. So, and that for me is, it's a very good grounding for any musician to learn to play piano. You know, piano, if you learn how to play piano, you can pretty much pick up most things. Then actually I didn't learn how to play the guitar until I was 17. And my dad always played 12 strings. So I started guitar when I was 17. And then shortly after that, I started learning to play the harmonica. When I was very little, I was always an exhibitionist. I always wanted to be center of attention. I always liked to go into the classrooms in school and do some kind of performance so that people would watch. I also have very distinct memories of being told that I was a dreamer, that I would never listen or concentrate. I always lose, my head was in the clouds, you know, I was always thinking of something else, which is true. You never expected anything off the one that was always quiet, the one that you kind of forgot about, but then the one that always actually shocked everybody in the end because you never expected that one kid to be that, you know, the one that would end up having number one albums or being really successful or doing any of these things. So yeah, I was I was very quiet and very reserved, but I was always, always dreaming, always thinking, always plotting, you know, planning my next little adventure. My mum was friends with the local landlord of the, the pub in the village nearby. The band practiced in the hall of this, in like the function room of this pub. And we went to this pub one night. My mum went to see her friend Derek, who, who was the landlord. It, it kind of all came from there. Well, he introduced Sandy to 
uh, a couple of the guys, Nigel and uh, the drummer, and I think all this kind of came from there. He told me there's this band, you know, back in this function room that they're, they're rehearsing, and he knew that I was a singer and I wanted to be a singer professionally and everything. So he said, you know, go, go in and see them, you know. I was only 14 at the time. These guys were all like 45 and above. All, all dudes, all men. And so I sang uh, Love Hurts by Cher. They all kind of turned around and looked at me and went, oh damn, you really can sing, you know? And that was it really. After that, I joined the band and then started gigging like every weekend or every other weekend with these guys. Sandy, I guess, really was the making of the band. Because at that point, they did a lot of gigs, the, the, um, but they'd never really had a, a, a singer with a voice that could portray their songs and the covers that they played in a way that they could. And such a young girl as well. As, a, as the last song of the night, we played Go Your Own Way by Fleetwood Mac. They did, our, our version did, you know, and it was great. Everybody would sing it. Everybody had their hands up in the air, you know, go your own way. And it was brilliant. So when I saw the way that my voice affected these people, it was so, it made me so happy, you know. I just can't break through your heart of stone now. Liverpool Institute Performing Arts, you have to show that you, be, her main instrument was her voice. So Lippa, there are different types of courses. The great thing about Lippa is that it's not mandatory for you to have to read music. My musical um, horizons expanded when I was in Lippa because I met all these different musicians, introduced me to all these different types of music. She was playing in a band when she was at Lippa. She was also in choir. It was very R&B, very soul. It was really cool actually, and very gospel. Lots of, lots of voices, lots of um, intricate, detailed parts. That, far away from anything that I'd done before, nothing like you know, simplistic pop music. For four years, it's a lot of studying. You're not, it's not just happening overnight. It's a process of becoming a musician. When I graduated, the guys that had been in my band from the beginning stayed with me. They were with me from the moment that we met to everything, through everything, through the, the success, through the albums going to number one. They toured the world with me. So, you know, we had this like, insane adventure from when we started out in college and, and performing arts school together. Just seven weeks, a 24-year-old musician has gone from webcam wannabe to rock star wonder. Uh, I saw the ability to live stream through a webcam from my basement in my house in my flat in London. Every night at nine o'clock, we would go live. So they tuned in, some people tuned in, they tuned in. Then every other single news media outlet in the country wanted to know what was going on. Then the numbers went through the roof to like hundreds of thousands of people watched this because nobody's ever heard of this before. Like, what is this? This is mental, right? Oh, I wish I was a punk rocker with flowers in my head. In 77 and 69, revolution was in the air. I was born too late to a world that doesn't care. Oh, I wish I was a punk rocker. Ian and I had a relationship on different levels. We had a relationship as a manager and an artist. We wrote this, uh, we wrote some of Punk Rocker, mostly all of it, in a hotel boardroom. 
So we just started writing about 60s and the 70s. And I think one of us said, I wish I was a punk rocker. And the other, I, he said that. And I said the other line, because I have flowers in my hair, because I've always been like this kind of hippie kid. The absolute core of punk rocker is nostalgia. It's about a bygone era. I really admired both of those times. The, the 60s and the 70s, you know, had these movements. There was the 69, the Summer of Love, the Woodstock, the hippies, the post-war revolution. And then there was the 70s, it was like punk, non-conformism, you know? So punk rocker is, at the core, is about that. It's about non-conformism. It's about going back to a time where people were united against something. Released independently, and it went to 55 in the UK chart. When I signed to Sony, I gave them an album, a video, a cover, everything I'd already done myself, ourselves. So we signed that whole product over. Punk Rocker was released. It did 750,000 copies in the UK alone in one week. And it also broke the record in Australia for being the longest female artist at number one. Oh, I wish I was a punk rock girl with flowers in my hair. This nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. That album was the most honest and the first of all the records I've made. Um, it was the best showcase of my voice. It was the best showcase of my influences, musical influences. Like you could really hear the influences from when I was growing up. Flesh and Blood is a song that I, I resonate with for sure because it's um, almost, it's like a protest song. Given what's going on in the world, it's a song that resonates with me very much. I got to record a song with Buffy St. Marie, who was like an idol of mine as I was growing up as a musician. And yeah, I met a lot of great people and I made some great records and I grew musically in myself, you know. My first impression, I thought she was really sh uh, shy. She was very quiet, you know, she was very, you know, unassuming. And, and we were introduced to each other and I actually saw her perform first. So when I reached to uh, shake her hand, she was like, almost like, who are you? You know what I mean? I've been playing with uh, Sandy now for, I guess about eight or nine months now. Hey baby, I just got back from town. Said 
So now I'm a stand and watch While it all falls down And the buzzards and the hawks And the judges and the mob They circle round Now if I, I were the queen Sandy was always um, an animal lover. My passion for animals has been lifelong. Very compassionate and full of empathy for animals, yes. And our horse was our best friend. Like I did always when I moved to Bahrain, I got involved with the local rescue centre. And everybody said, go to the dog father. The dog father is the one no-kill no animal shelter in the country. After the death of the founder of the former shelter. From there, I then building another shelter here in Bahrain. Legalized the whole thing, brought it up to, to date now, it became Bark. So it's a lot of work, not only just with the framework of the organization and the structure and the legalities and oh, so many things, but also just day-to-day -day animal care. Oh, 
but the feelings are wrong. Your heart is as black. Your heart is as black. Your heart is as black. Is black. I used to think that it was all about hard work. Hard work, practice, 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 hard work, practice, practice, practice. Even in the height of my success, I still didn't believe enough. Even now, I still struggle with believing in myself, believing that I'm even good enough. I don't, I watch people's mouths move and their lips move and they tell me that, you know, this is crazy, you're ultra talented and blah, blah, blah. And I still don't believe them. My pitfalls in life have come from that lack of self-belief at times in my life, for whatever reason that was. I think confidence is something that has catapulted many people to success who didn't belong there. People that were mediocre singers, people that weren't that talented, but they're very successful because they really believed in themselves. The recipe for success, whether it, you know you want to be a musician, whether you want to be a chef, whatever it is, is ultimately you first of all have to believe that you're capable of it. So all of that discovery is like, that's in the journey. But ultimately you have to start out with like unshakable self-belief in, in any walk of life. This time catches everyone. Been through this such a long, long time, just trying to hear. 